Well, thanks. It's, uh, it's an honor to uh, have been invited to this group of folks. It's uh, just pleased to be part of the community. I will tell you I'm a bit intimidated. I'm an English major by trade, so being with a bunch of mathematicians and science, scientists can kind of freak me out. Yeah, all right, good, we got one. Um, I am, uh, I've been a 25 year educator. I am absolutely positively committed to transforming the education system. And uh, I'm gonna tell you a story today about why systems thinking is so critical to this transformation. Contrary to popular belief and what you hear in the media, our public school system today is operating better than it has ever operated before at producing the results it's always been designed to produce. Okay? And so my, uh, what, I, what I see today is we're at a crossroads as a country because school districts, public education does not get the credit it deserves for the work it did in the 20th century. Our public school system was designed in about 1890 using the, system, the best systems thinking of the day, classic, classic mechanical systems thinking, to address an industrial age that was just emerging on the scene. And they did it beautifully. Our forefathers designed an education system perfectly aligned to the work they had to do. And it helped America Cup become the greatest uh, economic and military superpower the world's ever seen but we don't share that context today. We don't live in that world today. Yet our system continues to produce uh, and be designed for that old age. So here's a basic uh, premise of my talk today. The education system is not broken. It's obsolete. And we make the mistake, we, the collective in this country, we make the mistake that our system is broken, right? So to make this really clear, we have been spending our time as a country trying to get that typewriter to be an iMac through continuous improvement because we don't want to assume that the system's wrong. We want to assume it's broken. Okay? So I'm arguing today our system is obsolete. Why is it obsolete? Well, we know the context has dramatically changed in the last two or three decades. That's obvious. But what's less obvious is the function that the school, current school system was designed to produce. Now we have to go beyond 1890 to Thomas Jefferson in 1781, who in the notes of the state of Virginia identified the function of public education. He said, the purpose of public education should be to rake the genius from the rubbish, All right? Now in the industrial age, they softened the language and they said, we need to sort and select people out those who can and those who can't, right? And we need a whole bunch who can't because they need to fill the factories and we need a few to go on to Harvard and Yale and, and the like, okay? That is the function our school district structures and processes are designed to produce today because the system, the mechanical system is completely designed for that end. To share with you uh, examples of why why this narrative, the dominant narrative of who I call the reformers, uh, I want to give you some, some headlines in the last year that have appeared in various papers across the country. The governor, one of the governors says, failing schools should get the death penalty. Half of U.S. schools are failing federal standards. Public high schools are not doing their jobs. 2,000 of our schools are coasting, says a watchdog as it cracks down on educational mediocrity. And our education chief, Arnie Duncan, visionary that he is, thinks that perhaps we should start school later in the day that that might fix our problems, right? And so we have leading reformers, people who have an implicit understanding of systems, who believe things like this, grading schools based on test scores, forcing students to repeat grades if they don't pass standardized exams, is how we will change public education. And perhaps the most famous reformer, Michelle Rhee, has learned that cooperation, collaboration, and consensus building are way overrated, which would explain why uh, she didn't accept Alan Jim's invitation to join us, I suspect. I tell you all this not to degrade these people because at their core they want to make a difference, but because their orientation towards systems is flawed or obsolete. 
Jamshid Grajadagi teaches us that without an explicit theory about the system that you're in, all you do is recreate the same non-solutions over and over and over again. And I can give you a 50-year history of reform efforts in education that look just like the ones we're asking our states and our schools to do today. So what, why is reform, what is reform, and why is it embedded in education in the classical systems theory? Reform by definition means the improvement or amendment of what is wrong, corrupt, or unsatisfactory. It's this belief that you can continuously improve yourself into something new and different. I can take that typewriter and if I just apply the right principles, it'll become an iMac, right? That's the assumption. Think back to those headlines. What did you hear in those headlines? When I hear those headlines, I hear fear, retribution, deficit thinking, blame, right? As an educator, I'm stupid, I'm lazy, I'm incompetent, I'm a coaster, right? Nothing about the system, it's about the people that they, they go after. Along with the reform then, are implicit assumptions that lay under the surface of the system. And they often go untested, right? And some of you may believe these just because you haven't really put much thought into it. But the things like grades and standardized tests are valid measures of learning. That time spent with a teacher in a class is effective, right? That one, one point in time test tell us all we need to know about kids, that assigning kids by age-based um, batches is the best way to organize for learning, right? Standardized curriculum, standardized instruction, standardized teacher preparation programs, right? It's this mechanical drive for standardization, efficiency, reduction of choice and variation, right? Those are good if you're working with machines. They're not good if you're working with people, right? My job, my job is to prepare children for a future that none of us knows. We can't predict and we don't know, right? So if you think you got it tough, I'm right there with you, right? But I want to tell a different story. I want to create a different narrative. And I want to start with the function of education. I fundamentally believe the new function of education today is to unfold the potential of every child in our midst a fundamentally different function than the current system is able to do. And it's my belief that the best way to do that is through sociocultural systems thinking and methodology. What does that mean? What does transformation mean? Transformation means using the human capacity to create something that doesn't exist by asking a simple but profound question. What is it you'd have if you could have what you wanted today without constraints and then begin to iterate and design towards that future that you want? That's the essential question. It's an order of magnitude kind of design. I'm not interested in increasing my kids' scores on the reading test 3% next year. Inadequate, inappropriate, in the end, doesn't really matter. I, I need order of magnitude change. I can't do that with a mechanical orientation to systems. So my new narrative is one of transformation. It's one of hope, not fear. It's one of uh, possibility, not problem. And it's one of community, not coercion and compliance. Right? And I want to share, uh, share this with you. One of the things that I learned in my travels is that with, without a shift in thinking, Methodology is just technique, and practice is just imitation, right? And we see that happening in education all the time. But more importantly, I was like, what is this shift of thinking? What, what are we talking about, right? Because when I go out and I ask people, what is it you want schools to produce for our kids? And if I had the time to ask you, you would tell me the same thing I hear from everybody else. They need to be collaborative. They need to be complex problem solvers. They need to be adaptive. They need to be creative and innovative. They need to work in diverse teams. They need to deal with complexity. They need to communicate across all kinds of mediums. Right? Am I crazy? Would you come up with something else, right? 
our community says those things. And then I ask them, how would we get there? Well, we need better teachers, higher standards. We need to hold kids back at third grade if they're not reading. They revert back to the old. And so I was confused by that. And I came to understand that a community's culture and an organization's culture is its DNA. And DNA replicates a shared image over and over and over again. And unless I could penetrate the shared image in my community of what school looked like, what it was supposed to look like, I have little chance of transforming the system. And so I was perplexed by this and I, I just kept, I couldn't find a solution. They know, they can tell me, but they can't, they can't see that their systems paradigms in the way. And so my friend and mentor, Chuck Peters sat me down one day and says, Trace, you need to remember one thing. We are all inferential processors in a quantum soup, right? You have to get them to see that the soup, they don't see the soup they're in. How do you help them see the soup? Well, what a great question that was. We thought about it, my uh, colleague and I, and we said, aha, we got it. And we launched the Billy Madison Project. Now, if you're a 90s pop uh, culture person, you know exactly what I did. If you don't, turn to the person who's smiling right now, they'll explain it to you. <laughs> We said the only way you can truly understand something is to embed yourself in it, right? And we all went to school, we all share that common experience, but all of our thinking about it is flawed, right? So let's put those community members back in school. So we said, let's put them back in school for half a day, not as a visitor, not as a guest, but as a student, right? So we put some poor people in calculus and they had a calculus test that day, right? Um, they had to follow the schedule and engage in the discussions and take the quizzes, right? And then we brought them back for another half day and said, with your adult eyes and your adult experiences and what you know you need to know, what did you see? And the transformation, the shift in thinking was profound. They all of a sudden, they got it. They're like, you know what? Solving individual parts of the system, improving, putting a quality teacher in every classroom, improving test scores, adding more courses to the curriculum, none of that will ever fix it. It'll just make it worse. I had them. I had them understanding transformation, right? We face wicked problems. We don't face hard problems. Wicked problems are intractable. You can't find a cause. You can't get to root cause in a complex uh, wicked problem, and every solution you apply affects the problem moving forward. So you can't just come with simple solutions. You have to redesign the system to meet the function that you're after in the context that you're in. Context, function, structure, process, all together. The other thing that sociocultural systems thinking does is it appreciates that human beings are the exact opposite of machines. We're variable, we're unpredictable, we're filled with wonder and awe and hope, and we can create things that don't yet exist. How could we possibly believe that using a classical systems thinking approach would ever solve the problem of education? So we had them, right? Again, very different from a classical systems theory where the assumption is there's a problem out there, it just hasn't been appropriately applied. If you can just get everybody to follow that one solution, Everything will work. We want to be standardized, efficient, all those things, right? I'm not saying there's not a place in an education system for that, but that's not the foundational systems thinking that you need to use to build it. So the final piece for us was we, we got them thinking differently, right? And I don't have time to teach my community about systems thinking. They wouldn't tolerate it, one. Like, they think I'm nerdy enough. Um, so we said, well, our community said, we, we just don't see it, Trace. We, we get it. We know what we've got isn't what we want. We can't see it. So my colleague and I, Sean Cornelli, the finest teacher I have ever met planet, my 25 years in this business, we said, let's start a school inside our community school district. 
So we started the Big Ideas Group. And we denied virtually all those assumptions I shared with you early. We denied and rejected all of them. And we said, we're going to build, build our school on four things. It's going to be community-facing. It's going to be competency-based. It's going to be driven by projects. And it's going to be focused on kids' passions and interests. That's its four foundational principles. And so we have kids just getting started to show our public what a transformed school could look like and convince them that we can take this to scale. All right? To finish my uh, talk up, I want to share the story of McKenna, one of our students. McKenna really liked environmental issues, was really interested in it, and she became interested in Iowa's run water runoff, ironically. Uh, that our water tends to have lots of nitrates and tends to have a lot of heavy metals in it. And uh, our, obviously our water treatment plants do a poor job of dealing with that and requires lots of chemicals and so forth. And so she said, I want to understand phytoremediation. I want to figure out a solution to this real community problem, community facing. So she went about building an experiment in her backyard where she would run the fluent through a system she built, and she looked for native Iowa plants and trees that would pick up uh, the heavy metals and waters. And she ran these experiments over several months' time with support from Sean and guidance from Sean. And she got it to the point where she built a model that would work. And so she took it to the local community, the wastewater treatment plant, said, hey, I've got this solution for you. They're like, hey, that's really cool. You know, um, our problem is, unless it's financially viable, it doesn't matter. We are taxpayers won't pay for it. So she goes back to the drawing board and she starts learning about e economics and do, doing all kinds of complex studies. And she's close to having it figured out how it's less expensive for a community to do her solution than to continue to pour chemicals into our water. Right? So why do I tell you this story? It's competency based. She knows more about chemistry, biology, horticulture, calculus, trigonometry, economics. And oh, by the way, she had to give these speeches to the uh, town council. So she's got those language skills, communicating across diverse audiences for diverse purposes, right? And she's solving a real world problem. We can document all the standards of the things she's learning in a very different way, a very engaging way. And now, would you, if you were a college admissions person, you want McKenna coming to your college? Or do you want this person over here who says they have a 4.0 and they took all these AP classes? That's the future that I'm about. That's why I think systems thinking is critical to this. And that's why I'm appealing to you to help change the narrative in our country. The reform-minded classical systems thinkers can no longer dictate this conversation. And it's only those of us in the room and our colleagues who understand this, we got to get in the fray. We got to enter the game. Thank you.